Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is the Buchla 296 Programmable Spectral Processor. The 296 has a filter bank consisting of 16 bands. And this graph represents my calculation of the magnitude frequency responses of the top 15 of those 16 bands. But there's something wrong with this analysis, and I'm hoping that somebody watching this video will help me figure out what's wrong. The lowest of the bands is on the right side of the schematic, and it has some kind of weird topology I don't recognize. So I'll need to think about that separately later. If you do recognize this topology, please leave a comment below. The 296 is extremely complicated, and it has a lot of parts. It consists of 10 daughter boards that plug into a mainframe. So a couple of those boards have circuitry associated with summing various output signals, but eight of them contain filter banks, two per board. One of the boards has the low-pass filter I mentioned earlier and one bandpass filter, and the rest of the boards have two bandpass filters each. So these kinds of boards are more or less the same with just different component values. Now, each bandpass filter actually consists of three two-pole bandpass filters in series, forming a six-pole filter. The topology of each of those two pole filters is referred to as a multiple feedback topology. The overall architecture of each of the channels uses an idea called staggered tuning. Basically, you tune one of the bandpass filters in series in order to have its center frequency where you want it, and then the other two filters, for one of the filters, you move the frequency slightly one direction, and for the other filter, you move it slightly the other. So when you put these all in series, you get this relatively flat response, but you have a couple of horns on the sides. These signals come in in the upper right part of the schematic. The filters for one of the channels are found here, here, and then here in series and the filters for the other channel are found here, here, and here in series. I found this really fantastic web page on multiple feedback bandpass filters by Rod Elliott, and in general, you should go look at Rod Elliott's web pages for pretty much anything. So in the code I'm about to show you, what Rod called R1, I called RI for input. What Rod called R2, I call RG for resistor to ground. And what Rod called R3, I called RF for feedback. If we scroll down a little bit on Rod's webpage, we can find that he provides a series of formulas, including one that I used for the gain at the center frequency, as well as one for what the actual center frequency is. I also found this eCircuit Center webpage on the topic, which also gives some formulas. These are actually equivalent to the formulas that I just showed you from Rod Elliott's webpage. The center frequency is specified slightly differently. It's specified slightly differently in terms of parallel combinations, and I actually use these forms for the center frequency and the Q in the code that I'm about to show. I kind of like this parallel formulation. My code is a MATLAB script, but it runs just fine in GNU Octave, which is essentially a free open source rewrite of MATLAB. I'll include this code in the YouTube description, so you can cut and paste that and try this yourself. I'm first defining this Don FC table. This is the set of center frequencies for the different filters that Don defined in that table in the schematic. I then define the various capacitors and resistors given in that table using the numbering scheme on the schematic. Now, one challenge is that the various filters actually include trim pots. So although I use the values for the input resistors and the feedback resistors, what I'm calling a ground resistor, I'm not actually using these values. I'll talk about this in detail a little bit later. Essentially, I reverse engineer what these values should be based on the target center frequencies that Don listed. I just put these into the program so I can do some comparisons later. 
Now, I'm going to be expressing our second order transfer function in the Laplace domain. So I compute a series of frequencies going from 50 hertz to 20 kilohertz. But for the s variable in the expressions later, I need to multiply that by 2 pi j. j here is the square root of negative 1. If you would like to understand these ideas better, I suggest checking out my lecture on transfer functions and frequency responses from my ECE 3084 signals and systems class. After some setup, I loop through the various 15 filters. In these lines, I'm basically taking the nomenclature on the schematic and converting it to my own local nomenclature. In these lines, I reverse engineer what that resistor to ground, as I called it, needed to be in order to target the particular center frequencies Don was looking for. I map those back to the notation on the schematic, adding C for computed, and this basically lets me do a sanity check. If the values I compute for these resistances, if it's way off relative to the values given on the schematic in terms of what I could dial in with the trim pot, then I know something's radically screwed up. I then compute the various center frequencies in both radians per second and hertz, and then I compute the Qs and the gains at the center frequency from the formulas I found on those websites. I then compute the actual two-pole transfer functions for each of the three filters in series, and then we can multiply those together to get the final frequency response. You can learn more about second-order filter functions from lectures from my EC34 Signals and Systems class, and I would also point you to this lecture on the mathematics of second-order filters from my ECE4450 analog circuits for music synthesis class. Now you may wonder, why am I multiplying this by 150 divided by 4.7? Well, without going into too much detail about the odd even structure of the 296, it looks like the signals that are going into the filters wind up subject to this inverting amplifier kind of stage that has 150k ohm in the feedback loop and 4.7k as an input resistance. And it makes sense to me that Don would put a lot of gain here because staggered tuning filters like this tend to drop the gain a great deal. Okay, so let's run my little program and it makes a plot. We'll talk about that plot in a little bit. But right now, I want to do some sanity checks. So let's see what happens if I take my computed center frequencies and subtract the target frequencies indicated by Don. I get things within reasonable machine precision. And let's see, let's also take my calculated resistor values. So I have like this resistor 2 and 38 with the C and subtract the values on the schematic. And what I want to see is that these are all within the realm of what I could dial in with the trim pot. And that is the case. Let's try this with this R70 and this R75. Whoops, I have one too many fives. Let's see, one too many Rs. Okay. Yep, that makes sense. Let's see, so we've done 2 and 38 and 70 and 75. What else do I have here? Ah, let's take R7, 42C and subtract R7, 42. Whoops, let's see. Ah, there we go. Again, that's all within the 1K trim pots on the schematic. Okay, let's take a look at the resulting Q values. And let's see. Ah, the... Q values you see on the right, those are for the filters that is at the center frequency, so that's a fairly small Q. The filters that are on the edges, those have higher Qs. And interestingly, it looks like there are higher Q values for the bands in the middle and much lower values of Q for the bands at the extremes. And just for completeness, let's look at the gains. I think I called those A. Okay, so the gains are really all over the place. 
But I should emphasize that it's hard to look at a table like this in isolation and try to figure out what the apparent gain of a given channel of this Bukla 296 is going to look like because these are the gains associated with the three filters in series that have different cues and different center frequencies, and those are going to interact in complicated ways. So when I look at this plot, there is a lot to like. The overall location of the bands in terms of where they are in frequency seems to be reasonable. The transitions seem to be in nice spots here. I have these little horns on each of the bands that I would expect from a staggered tuning structure. But there's this weird decline in overall amplitude going from low frequencies to high frequencies that I don't understand. In particular, this lowest frequency band here is way off from the others. Now, if it was just one band or two bands that was kind of out of whack, I would assume that I'm misreading the component values. But the fact that there's this consistent trend going from left to right on the graph, I don't know what to make of this. It's possible Don could have done this on purpose for some reason, but I don't know what that reason would be. And when I've seen the outputs of spectrum analyzers where people will, for instance, shove white noise into a 296 and look at the output, the bands have pretty even heights. So I don't know what's going on here. Maybe there's something wrong with my math. Maybe there's something wrong with my coding. Maybe there's something going on on the schematic where there's some other amplitude scalings going on for the different bands that I'm overlooking. I don't know. If you have any insight on this, please leave a comment below because this has been driving me to distraction.